Please be advised, all music tracks used in this production are sole property of Kelsun Communications and are original compositions. Thank you. Hey, it's Scary Jones, executive producer of Elvis Duran and the Morning Show on Z100. I want to talk to you all about my friend and fellow Brooklyn College alumnus, Silas. Your e-journalist, social work advocate, Silas hosts and produces the award-winning Kelsun On The Air Social Work Podcast. My friend and fellow BCR alum is now known nationally and internationally as Silas, your e-journalist, social work advocate. His podcast, it's also listed as one of the top social work podcasts you must follow. The award-winning Kelson On The Air Social Work Podcast. Hello and welcome to all our listeners and viewers. This is Silas, your e-journalism social work advocate, producer and host of the award-winning Kelson On The Air Social Work Podcast, available wherever you get your podcast. Our podcast is rated internationally as one of the 40 best social work podcasts you must follow. This podcast promotes, celebrates, uplifts, and highlights the social work profession. Our aim is to educate the general public about the powerful impact social workers have on the lives of those they serve. The podcast will also amplify the vital contributions professional social workers make in every aspect of our society every day. Hello, everyone, to all my listeners and viewers. This is Silas, your e-journalism social work advocate, host of the, I'm proud to say, award-winning Kelso on the Air Social Work Podcast. Today, I have a really exciting show lined up. I have a very dear colleague and longtime friend of mine. So today, my guest is Dr. Amy Myers. She's a PhD, and she's also a licensed clinical social worker. She's a professor of social work at Malloy College, and she's a psychotherapist with 30 years of practice experience. And later on in the show, she's going to talk to us about how a social worker gets to earn and keep and promote the title of them being a psychotherapist, because a lot of people don't understand that. Um, She's an expert in sibling abuse and has published and presented nationally on that topic. She's also conducted numerous trainings and workshops on diversity, equity, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and received the Long Island Business News Diversity Award for Educating Communities. She maintains a private practice in New York City and is the podcast host of the very popular podcast series, What Would Dr. Myers Do? And towards the latter part of the show, we're going to let Dr. Myers talk about the podcast, how it came about. But right now, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Myers. We really appreciate it. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. And so I want you to start out by telling listeners the whole concept of a social worker being dubbed a clinical social worker. And I want you to just kind of lay that piece out before we go into the topics that we've already agreed that we were going to talk about. So explain to listeners and viewers what it means for somebody to be an LCSW. Absolutely. Okay. So social work is such a broad field, right? So broad. There's so many areas that you can work in. And um, I'm sure that you've addressed this. Well, you have addressed this. I've listened to your podcast. You've addressed this wholeheartedly, right? How how broad it is and all the different things you can do as a social worker. So I just want to distinguish between being a case management type of social worker and a clinical social worker. And people see these things as very distinct and they are to some degree, but there's also overlap. So a case manager is somebody who's seeking to improve the quality of somebody's life through oftentimes either changing uh, something within the individual to help them function better or changing something within their environment to help impact them in a more positive way. And really the basis of social work and what distinguishes it from psychology is that even though we may be working with the individual, we are always considering the individual in a greater context, right? The context of their family, the context of the um, immediate environment, which includes culture, which includes education, which includes um, career, which includes systems such as healthcare, such as neighborhood, such as 
uh, sometimes child welfare, uh, and whatever it may be, sometimes parole or probation or the legal system. So we're always considering a client and how they are impacting their environment and how they are impacted by their environment. That's the field of social work as a whole. So a case manager tends to work with somebody in regard to advocating for services that they may need, empowering them to access resources that may be available to them that they might not be aware of, serving as a liaison or a mediator between um, something that they need, whether it's a service or an entitlement, and helping them kind of bridge that connection. Right. You can also think about it in terms of because the field is so broad and there's many different um, systems that one can work with, what comes to mind immediately is a hospital. And a hospital social worker does many things depending on the unit, say, that they're working on. They could be working on a, in a dialysis unit and they're helping to make the client as comfortable as possible while they're receiving their dialysis, whatever that might mean. It might be educating a client on the medical aspects of the treatment, right? And then it might be helping um, them access resources when they're not in the hospital receiving their treatment to, uh, to uh, make their life more comfortable when they're at home. Somebody might be on a uh, maternity unit, right? A maternity ward where they're educating and informing clients about um, breastfeeding or about uh, a care, you know, care of a newborn baby. So again, educational, also linking them to resources. What do they need to improve their quality of life outside? They might be working on a unit, a pediatric unit and dealing with children who have um, long-term terminal illnesses and working with the caregivers, right? So this is like providing kind of support services, liaison services, referral services. That's case management. Clinical social work is really helping people to understand their circumstances and to cope with their circumstances. So any of the examples that I just gave you could involve case management, but of course you're also going to be supportive. You're also going to be empathic. You're also going to engage the client to help them come to terms with whatever they are dealing with, right? As we move into the more clinical aspect I work from a psychodynamic framework. So this is under the umbrella of psychotherapy. So a social worker can become a psychotherapist. You can also go through other trainings to become a psychotherapist. But to be interested in clinical work, what you're really doing is helping somebody understand how they think, how they feel, and how they act, and how that impacts the way that they are uh, moving through life and the impact that it might have on their work life, their interpersonal relationships, or whatever might be their struggle at hand, right? So if we understand how you developed into who you how how you developed into who you are, then we can try and look at what needs to be shifted to get you where you want to be. And that can be short-term work or it can be long-term work, depending on the type of therapy you subscribe to. Um, but I always say like, it feels really different, right? The case management piece and the clinical piece, but they, they do have to intertwine. Like I can work as a psychotherapist. And if I think that there's some point that I'm not going to be doing case management, I'm mistaken because somebody could come to me and say, I'm helping them with interpersonal relationships. And then six months into our work together, their spouse asked them for a divorce. Am I not going to provide information about support groups or mediation services, or maybe even, you know, point them in the direction of legal counsel. Of course I am, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I have to have resources kind of at my fingertips as needed as they come up. And on the other hand, if you think you're doing case management without clinical work, I think you're also mistaken because even though the primary focus might be on case management and linking to services, I always give the example like, say you're working with the homeless population, somebody loses their home. And so what's your job? You're working as a case manager. Your work might be helping them to find housing. Well, so they, they're going into a shelter and then they find housing. You know, maybe they're renting somewhere and they lose their housing and they're back in the shelter system. And this happens again and it happens again. And you could keep providing them with 
um, housing referrals. But if you don't get to the core of why this is happening, right, what's what's impeding their ability to maintain a stable existence, then you're just going to keep putting the Band-Aid on and it's going to keep coming off, right? So we have to do some exploration and understanding, right? Mm-hmm. And so in that way, they kind of interweave, but you can certainly have a preference of where you'd like the, the bulk of your work to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Now, you, you made a very interesting point in, a, I guess, a, co- a comparison point. And, and that's been one of the things that, that, that in, in the social work realm has been kind of, uh, there's been a kind of little, a little bit of friction. And that is, so a social worker as a case manager. So a social worker can be a case manager or do case management. But in a lot of instances I've seen, and it's been evident that there are people who have well-intentioned uh, motives, very skilled and talented at what they do. And the, 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 the workforce or society will deem them a case manager. And they're doing everything that you just said. They're helping an a individual, uh, you know, interact with systems and finding them resources and so forth and so on. So uh, how how does the general public, in your opinion, differentiate with some, from someone who is a social worker providing case management services versus someone who's a case manager? Because what what I what I found and the research has shown is that, especially in the public sector, um, the the especially New York State, the, the seven um, state agencies, um, and you know we know we talk about OMH, Oasis, or OFC, OFCS, Office of Family and Children Services. They will hire somebody, well-meaning, very talented, and they providing case management services. And they will hire them at a specific salary. Now, someone goes to school, gets their BSW, goes on to get their MSW, maybe even goes on to get their LMSW. And they go to that agency, they see an opening, they go to that agency, and they apply for a job, and they get hired, but they get hired under the realm of them being a case manager or providing case management services. And so the salary that they're offered is the same exact same salary as somebody who maybe has years of case management services but doesn't have the credentials. So how how, how can the general public um, differentiate between the social worker providing case management services and the case manager who doesn't have the credentials or the education? Because I think that, in my opinion, has been a big issue with the whole concept of social workers not being recognized for the skill, the talent, the knowledge, and the training that we have. So can you address that? For Because for, for a lot of viewers and listeners are sitting out there going, well, gee, isn't this a case manager and a social worker the same thing? How would you answer that question? So when you say listeners and when you say the public, you, are you referring mm-hmm. to social workers or are you referring to the no, clients the, that ge- the general the general public and and hire, hiring entities a lot of hiring entities right they will they will hire two people one has a licensed LMSW and one of them doesn't have a degree or or has a degree in in something other than social work but mm-hmm. they look they lump them all together and call them all case managers so mm-hmm. how, how how would you educate listeners and viewers who are users of the service to to be able to say because you know what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to do in, in in my realm is educate the listening and viewing public that we have special skill, talent, and training that separates us from yes others. Fair. So uh-huh. so I, 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 how can we address that issue? Yeah, um, you know that's a great question. I think that consumers are always hesitant to question because they think if they question, then they're challenging right? They're being uh, confrontational and they're causing potential conflict. And when you're already vulnerable, thinking about, you know, I need a certain service, you don't want to upset the person that might be in front of you, right, is trying to service you. 
But as a consumer, you are entitled to know what you are getting, right? Just mm -hmm. think about it when we go shopping. What's in this product? I, I can read the back of the box and find out. So to me, there's the, the public. How do we educate the public is get informed. And you can do that either by Googling, hopefully through this uh, as well through this discussion, uh, mm -hmm. right, about what is the difference and what is the distinction. And also through asking anytime that you're working with somebody or approached by somebody and says, I'm going to be working with you, can you tell me your training? Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. I mean, because this undermines, right, the the training and the background and the skills and the potential expertise of people who are being lumped together right under one service or under one title when there are clear distinctions mm -hmm. and the distinction in reality I, I think as you're making very clear is in is in training you know yes. how much training does somebody have who's in this position and um I, I mean all i can do is really agree with i think you know what is at the core of your question which is that this is a problem mm -hmm. and uh it it needs to be addressed it's almost like creating a standard in the field right? Mm -hmm. There has to be a standard. And I consider myself a gatekeeper, right? As an academician who's training uh, bachelor level social workers to go into the field, what distinguishes you, yes. you know, bachelor of social work from, you know, somebody who doesn't have the degree and mm -hmm. you're wearing my name, right? Uh, on your lapel, so to speak, you're wearing mm -hmm. the Malloy name on your lapel. So we're mm -hmm. going to make sure that you have those skills and that mm -hmm. knowledge. And unfortunately, uh, others aren't holding their, you know, staff to the same mm -hmm. uh, elk. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think, you know, that that actually contributes to social work. You're talking about, well, let me go back, because you're talking about um, social workers being undermined, right, mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. by this process. Yes. And, um, I think that it's compromising the services at the same time. That, that, that too, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is this is a real issue. And then and then and then, and it does fall back to uh, you know you know one of the things that NASW you know which I'm a member and been so for a long time and they've always fought for something that we we term in the profession this title protection and 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 simply title protection says that. Um, you you can't lump everyone together and call everybody a case manager because then you lose the piece of a case manager who has a social work background and then that lowers the earning potential because if 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 one of the, if the one of the public agencies can hire somebody to do task A through E call them a social uh, call them I'm sorry call them a case manager and offer them a this particular salary and then a social worker comes along to fill that same role then they think that it's okay to pay that social worker what they're paying the non-trained so um person who's doing that same role and that again title protection and in, in new york state um for the longest time was hiring people calling them case managers and and when a social worker came along they just lumped them into the same category yeah. and so what one of the things that is re really important to a lot of especially students coming out is to know your worth no yes. you know be able to yeah. articulate the training mm -hmm. that you had that set you apart mm -hmm. and so then you can advocate for now now th there's there's understanding there's entry level and i get it entry level you know salaries coming but a social worker coming out with their BSW or MSW shouldn't have to settle for the same entry level salary as someone that doesn't have their training wow. and their expertise. So, so I, you know, like I've, I've always wanted to make sure that listeners and viewers understand that. Oh, oh, oh don't, aren't all social work don't have, doesn't have you? No, we're, we're, we're not the same. And yeah, so, you know. then we get to the clinical level because you got to get your BSW to your MSW. You got to take the license, the test to get a lot, become licensed. And then you got to get more hours in the field and then take another test mm -hmm. to get to your level, which is clinical. And that sets you and clinical social workers at an even higher level. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that, that gives you the right to call yourself a therapist and practice psychotherapy. 
What are some of the key things as a psychotherapist, treatment modalities? Talk about that special skills that you have that so, that clinical social workers have mm -hmm. that sets them ab ab apart and, and, and ab not above, but apart and different from others in the field. I will do that. But before I do that, I got to give a last word about your point, because it's such a valid point, mm -hmm. is that not only, uh, well, first of all, one of the skills is that we're really good at advocating for others. And we're not yes. so good at advocating for ourselves, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why, you know, part and part why this is problematic. The other issue is it's really interesting that, as I was saying before, not only does this issue um, do a disservice to the social worker, it does a disservice, as I said, to the client, but it also muddies the reputation of the field because when untrained case managers, right, the ones mm -hmm. who are not social workers, are relating to clients in a way that is not coming from an empathic point or a skill set, you know, area, and those clients have negative experiences, right? They're now uh, ascribing these characteristics to the field of social work. Mm -hmm. And that contributes to the negative uh, perception, societal perception of, of the field. That being said, what are the skills? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the skills are um, many. They are the ability to be empathic, which sounds so simple, but is really complex. And um, it's, you know, yes, at its core, being able to put yourself in somebody else's position and really imagine what it's like, because most of the people that we work with are in pain, they're struggling. And we are not necessarily in the business of fixing problems. We're helping the clients find the best solution for themselves, what works for them. So it's really important to have self-reflection. And the ability to, and, and, and I'm talking about on a deep level, whether you are a case manager or whether you are a clinical social worker, you don't want to operate from the, um, the locale, the place of what I would do in this situation, right? And we have to recognize that everybody's unique that everybody has different internal and external coping skills. And what works for me doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. And it's not a one-stop shop that, you know, there's this kind of uh, golden rule of when you have this issue, you do this. When you are struggling with this, you do this. And in order to really help a client figure out and explore what it what is best for them, what they need, uh, and build their ego and all of these things, you have to be able to distinguish your needs from theirs. You have to be able to recognize why am I saying what I'm doing? Why am I intervening? How I'm intervening? And is this serving the client or is this serving me? And when I say serving me, I mean anywhere on any level from it builds my ego mm. to feel like I'm making some brilliant interpretation to you about your life, right? And maybe about your dynamics and why you do things the way you do. But if you're not ready to hear it, it's going to be meaningless and it might also upset you, mm. right? You're not, you're not ready to hear it. So I have to be really attuned to the client, really be on the page that they're at at that given time. I also have to have a nice understanding of theory because part of clinical social work, as I tried to kind of lay out there in the beginning, is understanding human development understanding normative development, what that means, what is supposed to be happening emotionally, cognitively, biologically at certain phases of our development, right? And in order to, once I understand that, I have to understand what might interfere with that, what intercepts normative development, right? Is it biology? Is it is it nature versus nurture? Is it, you know, the caregiving you've had? Is it the lapse in systems that you've been exposed to? Is it um, some real uh, uh, cognitive limitations? Mm -hmm. what, what is causing that? Once I understand that, then that guides my, my intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there has to be some real theoretical understanding to be a clinical social worker. Yes, yes. Now, is in your opinion, is there a type of therapy that you think works best? 
<laughs> well, I was trained as a psychodynamic psychotherapist, bordering on psychoanalytic, which means really working with the unconscious, right? So mm. a lot of times people might say like, well, why do you do that? Well, that's just the way I am. Mm. I don't really buy that, right? No, we're not just the way you weren't born like this. You might be born with a certain temperament, but there are things that have shaped you into how you perceive things, right? So um, we need to kind of understand what that is. Um, and, and most of the time that's unconscious. It's not something in our awareness. So I work from this framework that we're trying to make the unconscious conscious and we're trying to understand transference. And transference mm. again, is a very complex um, concept that uh, I'll try and explain very, very quickly, but it's, it's very uh, multifaceted. So basically it's the idea that you live through life and you have certain experiences and certain relationships. And we take those in, we internalize them, and we make them our own, meaning the voices of others become our own voice. And the perceptions other people have had of us, either explicitly through saying, like, you're so stupid, right? Mm -hmm. Or implicitly, you know, doing things that just may make you feel less than, um, they get internalized and they become our self perceptions. And then we move through life externalizing or projecting those feelings and experiences and assume that other people are going to relate to us as we've been related to. So this can be, there can be positive transferences, right? Like I, just by looking at you, you remind me of somebody that I feel good about, right? Now, again, I might be aware of that. Oh, you remind me of my cousin who I just love, right? Or unconsciously, you just kind of give me a good feeling. Or these things could be negative. Right. I, you mm -hmm. know, you remind me of my high school bully and uh, it could be just physical looks on a real superficial level, or it can be the way that you relate to me. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now, and I always give my students the example of, you know, isn't it curious who chooses to sit in the front of the room, who chooses to sit in the back of the room, who's the one volunteering all the time, who's the one who never says a word. Right. Mm. Now, hypothetically, there could be a million reasons why that's the case. It could be something as simple as, I'm a thirsty learner and I want to hear every word. And so I'm sitting at the front. Mm -hmm. Or is it something like I need to be heard and seen because mm -hmm. I was never heard and seen growing up. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that if I sit front and center, you can't miss me. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the one who sits at the back who never speaks. Is that how they learn best by just taking things in? Or did they have a really critical voice that they've internalized? Mm -hmm. And so I'm never going to say something because they're probably stupid or I'll probably be wrong or people are going to think this or that. I'm going to be judged in some way. So I'm going to stay quiet. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But we move through. I mean, it becomes our entire being, not just in the classroom. That's one example. Right. But mm -hmm. in our intimate relationships, in our friendship relationships, in our mentor relationships or boss or supervisor relationships, part of who we are. Mm -hmm. So that's where I come from. <laughs> okay. So you know, now I'm glad you brought up the the, the, the concept of transference because in social work, you know, that's talked about a lot. But there's also counter-transference. So can you juxtapose those two? Yeah, they're very, it's really, really simple, but it gets confused all the time. Transference is basically <laughs> the client's projections onto the social worker or therapist. Mm -hmm. Counter-transference is the therapist projections onto the client. Okay. And so there's a two-way street here going on mm -hmm. all the time. And that's what I meant when I said self-reflection is so important because you have to consistently manage your own feelings and responses. Thank you. So um, now your career trajectory, What what? how did you get on the path where you decided you wanted to become uh, a therapist? Mm. Yeah. So here's my understanding. This is what I think, um, <laughs> whether it's true or not. First of all, my mom was a therapist, um, but really kind of interesting is she never, ever spoke about her work. She was a very private person. And, you know, you really kind of hold confidentiality to a high level when you're a therapist and mm -hmm. hopefully as a social worker, no matter what kind of social work you practice. Um, so I, it's weird in some way. I didn't really feel like I was exposed to what, well, what was she doing? So mm -hmm. is it in my genes? I don't know. The real <laughs> 
the reason I attribute to why I chose this career is because my own messed up family <laughs> dynamics that made me want to understand what went on here, you know, mm -hmm. what were some of my lived experiences. And um, I was always really interested in why people feel the way they feel, think the way they think and act the way they act. Okay. Okay. Um, now let's move into talk a little bit about private practice. So you, you've been um, a psychotherapist and you had 30 years of practice experience. So, so you decided to go into, into um, clinical social work. You wanted to do something with your, 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 your clinical background. And so you open up a private practice. So how does one go from graduating with their master's to getting the L to getting their C to putting out a shingle, so to speak? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, so a lot of people do think that if you graduate from two years of a master's program, you're ready to be a therapist. And most master's programs aren't teaching you how to become a therapist. They're teaching mm -hmm. you generalist social work. Yes, practice, yes. Right. So as I said, the field is really broad. So no matter what kind of you know, social work you're practicing, you're armed with the ability to work with all different types of populations, mm -hmm. right? But a therapist, as we've been talking about, has a, has a, has a slightly different or more advanced skill set. And, um, you know, I mean, I can tell you what I did, but things have changed. It's, as you said, it's 30 years ago. It's been a very long time. Um, so I'll tell you very briefly that I did not feel comfortable. I knew I wanted to be a therapist early on while I was in graduate school, but I did not feel comfortable or prepared coming out ready to say, oh, OK, I'm going to, you know, have a private practice now. So I waited two years. I got my feet wet in the field, really made sure that it was what I wanted to do worked at an outpatient mental health clinic where you are doing psychotherapy, right? You're seeing mm -hmm. clients kind of back to back. And then I thought I need more training because the supervision that I'm getting in the field is not sufficient to really hone my skills. So I went to a psychoanalytic institute. And back then, I think they had some institutes that might've been four years. Mine was 10. <laughs> it was ooh really ridiculous in a in a way when I look, oh, well, that's not fair. That's really not. Uh, it wasn't ridiculous. It was just an extensive, extensive uh, program. Part of it what, was- What was the name of it? The National Psychological asking. Association for Psychoanalysis. Okay. And I never finished. I went for 10 years and believe it or not, still wasn't finished because I, I came to the point where you had to see a client uh, three times a week for- I think at least a year. And what would happen is that clients would come and three times a week is a lot for somebody to come to therapy. <laughs> um, and I would get paid $15, all right, which was really nothing. Talk about being underpaid and undervalued, right? And if they stopped, so I could be seeing them for six months, I had to start all over again. Oh, wow. Right, to count those hours. <laughs> So mm. I thought, you know, the knowledge, the classroom experience, the readings, the theory, I had all gotten at that point, right? And so, and also you had to be in your own uh, analysis uh, three times a week for four years. I did that. I was in supervision for many years. I did that. So I stopped short of the actual um, practice, but I was practicing outside at that point with my own fees where I did feel mm. valued and getting mm -hmm. the experience and continued even after the 10 years with private supervision, because I think we're works in progress and, you know, you never stop learning in this field. Mm -hmm. Now they have psychoanalytic institutes that are even only uh, two years. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think it should be, you know, embrace it how much you want to embrace it. So you want a two year one, go to two year, four year one, go to four year. You don't want to go to any, that's fine too, because now the, um, Laws have changed and we're, we've gotten more stringent. And, and I think that's a good thing mm -hmm. where to be insurance reimbursable and practice as an LCSW in New York state, one, you have to pass the exam and then you have to complete 36 months of supervised experience in psychotherapy. And that means 2,400 hours, 2,400 hours of direct client contact and so it's a minimum of 400 client contact hours in any 12-month period. Pretty mm. stringent. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what was your original question? What do people need to do? Uh, I think that's it. That's, yeah. That's so, so, so just your, your that was kind of like, I was asking about your path to, to, right. to getting into um, so being a, cl a clinical social work um, psychotherapist. Now, um, what, what, what are some of the prevalent issues um, folks are facing in your, in your opinion? Uh, in the world at large? Is that what we're talking about? The world at large? What are they facing? Like, why do they come to therapy? Yeah, we, we, we can um, look at it from a broad perspective. Like yeah, that. Yes. I mean, I think I think there's a lot of anxiety and depression going on uh, mm -hmm. in all age groups. Uh, I focus on people generally, you know, I, I work with adults primarily. And um, I mean, I think that, that our social, political, cultural climate is in a really challenging place. And um you know, there's there's heightened anxiety and interpersonal issues in post pandemic era where people have social anxiety and um, are also at the same time feeling isolated. So sometimes it's either or you're isolated or you have social anxiety. And now it's kind of like combusted in mm -hmm. socially anxious. But I also am very safe and comfortable doing everything virtually. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, once upon a time where I think my practice was really full of people with interpersonal struggles, right, at the office and in, and in intimacy, um, now it's just kind of ramped up. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. how, how, in your opinion, how do you think the, uh, the pandemic affected um, society as a whole? Oh, boy. Well, I think that we have major communication issues. <laughs> I think that we have uh, immediate gratification needs, all because mm -hmm. of uh, our exposure to social media and, again, the virtual world. I think our social skills have been compromised. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of depression out there due to um, losses, both literal, right, uh, through death and the loss of relationships. Period. Mm. Now, there's, there's there's a saying out there that says, um, and, it, and it kind of falls along the you know the therapeutic um, um, lines of thinking and modalities that um, s some describe depression as anger turned inward that was never expressed. So, mm -hmm. so, 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 so how, how do people, in your opinion, feel comfortable? Mm -hmm expressing their rage in a non-threatening way? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if it's always anger turned inward, but yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. incredibly common, right? Unexpressed anger, a lot of hurt as, as the root of the anger. Mm -hmm. So it gets expressed through tears and anger, right? Um, being angry and disappointed at people and what they're not doing. You know, you're not nourishing me enough. You're not mm. filling me enough. Um, and how does that come out? I think that therapy often provides uh, reparenting, mm. way, right? Interesting. Um, providing what wasn't received. And, and that is through empathy and understanding. I always say at the core, what do most people want, right? We think hum uh, basic human needs, food, water, shelter. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And mm -hmm. to be emotionally understood and held, mm. right? So I, I think that's whether they know it or not, that's what they're coming to therapy for. And I think that when you do create a safe environment, when you do show genuineness and um, unconditional acceptance, uh, you arm people with the ability to get in touch with their vulnerable state and emotions. Mm -hmm. And over time, they learn and feel freer to express those. And when they do it with you as the therapist and you see that there's not some major consequences or repercussions in doing so, then you are able to kind of take that out into the real world and practice it. Okay. All right. Um, great, great, great insight on that. Um, what's your, some of the pros and cons of private practice? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, I never went into private practice full time because for a few reasons, one personally speaking, um, I don't know if I have that attention span or the emotional bandwidth. It takes a lot, as I said, since we're always self-reflecting and looking at what is being touched within us and being mm -hmm. attentive to that, it is incredibly emotionally draining. At the same time, you're holding the emotions of your clients. So mm -hmm. one after another, after another, after another, your cup runneth over. 
right? <laughs> so that's that's one reason it never appealed to me, but it also didn't appeal because I I always thought that it could be um, socially isolating. You don't have mm -hmm. colleagues, you don't have water cooler talk, you don't have <laughs> you know these things, right? Mm -hmm. So the then, how do you do the self care piece then? How do you, you do, do that? You, it takes you, a lot you, of you're effort. You're taking in all of this uh, right. emotional. Uh, people are out, you know, out um, exp expressing themselves. They're they're pouring out their anxiety and frustration to the therapist. You're, you're trying to hold space. The therapist trying to hold space for them. How, how does one then all of a sudden disengage and 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 do self care, which That's is huge now. That is huge now. And you know what our students tell us? They say, you know, you keep saying how important self-care is, but you don't teach us how to do it. <laughs> and it's true, right? Because, I mean, I think the first thing for self-care is time management. You have to pull yourself away from the work, literally. Yes, yes. We're talking about emotionally pulling yourself away. And how do you do that? Yeah. You have to get invested in something other than work. You mm. have to find something that's calming, that's soothing. So I know a lot of people say, well, you know, I get my nails done or I, I do that kind of pampering and maybe that's helpful, but you have to do something that literally cleanses your mind, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what is that that nourishes you? And one of the reasons that we, I think that, I mean, maybe it can be taught, but why I feel like I can't teach it is I don't know what that is for you, right? That's very individualized. Um, so, I mean, you know, a lot of people feel that mindfulness and meditation are important paths towards that. So, uh, I would agree with that. Um, I just want to come back to the one idea about, uh, the pros and cons, um, yes. because so networking is so important and I'm saying kind of what is contributing to a lot of anxiety and depression, right? Um, it would take a concerted effort to do that as a private practitioner, if you were doing this full time. So, mm -hmm. You know, you have to find ways to build community and engage with that. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, if you're in private practice, you're income, de income dependent on mm. your clients, right? right? So you have to always value yourself, but you also have to be flexible with what mm. can your clients afford. And when mm -hmm. you lose a client, again, it comes back to why am I trying to keep them? Do, I, do they really need therapy or am I scared of losing that income? So that's mm. just something to... Right? That's deep. That wow. is deep. Yeah. Um, the benefits, the benefits, yes, yes. it's your own schedule, <laughs> you know, so there's flexibility. You mm -hmm. use the clients when it works for you, you carve out your day. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it is, it is darn fascinating. I think mm -hmm. that it's a luxury, <laughs> right, of being privy to somebody's emotional life, that mm -hmm. they are entrusting you with their most precious commodity, right, their emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a field where you're always learning and growing professionally and personally. So what a gift is that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, your focus and your passion. My focus and my passion. Yes. Uh, my passion is helping people become more insightful and understanding of who they are and what they need. Um, so I, you know, going back to transference and counter-transference, mm -hmm. that's my thing. Um, uh, my passion as well as, uh, my expertise is in sibling abuse. Uh, Absolutely. I think that it's actually the most common form of family violence that has been found mm -hmm. and yet the least focused on. So, uh, my goal is to bring awareness, understanding, uh, of that to, uh, to basically everybody. And I think that those who've experienced need some validation around their experience and that it's not just sibling rivalry, it's a real lived experience of abuse. And uh, until our society acknowledges that, they're gonna continue to feel undermined and unacknowledged. So uh, I am passionate about that. Okay, so you know we, we've heard of uh, child abuse and elder abuse and substance abuse. Um, Peel back a couple of layers of sibling abuse. Is it still, is it is it is it is it uh, the same as sibling sibling rivalry or is it two separate things? With it is not abuse? sibling rivalry. Sibling rivalry. I'm glad you asked. Sibling. First of all, there can be emotional sibling abuse, physical sibling abuse, or sexual sibling abuse. Mm -hmm. It is basically the same thing as parent child abuse. Only it occurs between siblings, mm -hmm. and sibling rivalry is a normative part of development, right? Everybody who has a sibling experiences sibling rivalry. We we get mm. angry at each other. We fight. We have disputes. Um, but the difference is that with sibling rivalry, 
usually depending on when, either in the same discourse of an argument or from argument to argument, one sibling has power and then the next time the other sibling has power. With sibling abuse, one child is always in power and the other one is always at a disadvantage. Mm. In sibling rivalry, there's not a real intention to harm. In sibling mm. abuse, there's intention to harm. In sibling it- rivalry, one more one more fact if I can, mm-hmm. in sibling rivalry, um, there's actually positive outcomes because mm. you learn how to manage conflict, you learn how to cooperate, and you ne- learn how to negotiate. Mm. There are no positive outcomes of sibling abuse. And, 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 and is there a, a, a documented root cause of why sibling abuse takes place in the, in, in the first place? Um, uh, there's not a documented root cause. There are studies. Myself, I, I myself have conducted a, a lengthy study about um, what creates that. And there are many um, familial aspects, things that happen within the family and things that happen outside of the family that increase stressors that are brought into the family system. So it could be anything from parent-child abuse, um, which then models, right, and creates that kind of atmosphere within the home. There's uh, a child being in the caregiver position uh, and being resentful over that. There's substance abuse. You know, why does a why does an aggressor perpetrate sibling abuse? There's mental illness. Um, there's a lot of um, parental favoritism that creates resentment. Mm. There's single parent. Um, status oftentimes, which uh, creates stress within the home environment, which often leads to the one child being in the position of caregiver and Mm. kind of abusing their authority, but but, or abusing it or not really knowing how to manage it. Mm. Um, So oftentimes the aggressor is going through their own uh, troubled, you know, challenges, and they are displacing that onto their, their sibling. Okay, and you 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 work uh, a lot with that with that particular concept. Um, how, how do you uh, have you have you had a lot of success trying to navigate that between um, siblings, one who's abusing the other? I have to tell you, most of my work has been with the adults, so they're the survivor of the abusive experience. Oh, okay. And even, because there is even. such a lack of societal validation that this is a real and true phenomenon, we've gotten we've come a long way. So I did my study, I think, in like 2008 or so, and there were literally. I remember when I did my first uh, database search, and there were like three or four thousand articles on parent-child abuse, and I think there were about five on sibling abuse. I don't know how many currently exist, but there's a lot, a lot more. So because of that, people aren't coming into therapy saying, you know, uh, I am how I am because of this horrible relationship I've had with my sibling growing up, or I'm still contending with this with my adult sibling. What they're coming in with is interpersonal relationship challenges. Mm. When we scratch the surface, right, because we're so used to asking about, history in regard to parent-child relationships, Mm -hmm. we don't really explore the nature and quality of sibling relationships, but we Mm -hmm. need to because Mm -hmm. they are incredibly impactful. Okay. So let's talk a little bit as we get ready to to, to wrap up. Let's talk a little bit about what would Dr. Myers do, your podcast. (laughs) Tell us, you know, the genesis of it, you know, how, how it came about, you know, why you started it. And then, you know, as we, you know, get ready to wrap up, let people know where they can see it, hear it, view it, listen to it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, So what would Dr. Myers do? Uh, The idea for that came from a group of students, one particular cohort a couple of years ago, who were in my clinical practice class. And we talk about issues in the field and, you know, how to be a good social worker. And if this happens, let's talk through what you would do, what might you do? And then they're going into their field experiences as an intern. And one student said, oh, I wish I could pull you out of my back pocket and just kind of give you a call and say, what would Dr. Myers do? <laughs> and I said, wow, oh, okay, there might be something here. Um, but what, where that was coming from really was the lack of support um, that she was experiencing and where I've heard and seen many of other students experience this as well. And also as my role as professor, I'm also the director of field education. So I really have my eye 
on the changes in the field and what's what's out there. And students were feeling that even though they were having the experience of um, doing the work, they were beginners and they really didn't feel confident in what they were doing. And they didn't feel that they were getting enough support or direction or guidance in the field. Mm -hmm. So I thought of this as kind of a supplemental tool. Well, let's talk about the issues that most beginners contend with, whether mm -hmm. it's boundaries, self-disclosure, how to engage, how do I deal with trauma when I'm experiencing my own trauma. And it started with me talking with students and kind of providing like a, a group supervision experience, right, mm. through our discussions. And then I realized, well, there might be people out there who are more seasoned, who also, you know, want some guidance. And I decided that at the root of everything is understanding one's countertransference. How are mm. you being impacted emotionally by what by the work that you're doing? And mm. let's make sure that how you're being impacted isn't interfering, right? But it can also strengthen how you approach things. So the podcast is really about how we move through this work and what we're feeling as we're doing it uh, and how we're attempting to navigate that. But I'm also finding that it is appealing to everyone, which is really mm. nice because no matter what kind of work you're doing, if you're interested in understanding more about yourself, I think that each episode, every episode will speak to you in some way and make mm. you question who am I and how do I think about things? Mm. I have an episode on confrontation. Who doesn't have an issue with confrontation, right? Everybody thinks that that's marred with um, anger or conflict. But if we position ourselves and think about how we want to get our needs met and how we can optimize that, maybe confrontation doesn't have to be so scary, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what, and then I developed a, a a series on sibling abuse. So I'd say like every five episodes, I um, talk about an aspect of sibling abuse so that people can learn about it. And then I realized what was happening is that those who were experiencing it were so grateful to have a platform where um, they could feel validated and understand the dynamics behind it all. And so now I have a series where they're telling their stories. Mm. Okay. That's, that's what it's all about. Okay, and it's available both video and audio, and where can um, yeah, wherever you listen to the podcast, multiple okay. platforms, Spotify, Amazon, Pandora. I don't I like I, I forget all of them honestly, uh, <laughs> but you know pretty much wherever Google Podcasts, mm -hmm. and um, just launched about two weeks ago onto YouTube. So they're still uploading there day by day. Mm -hmm. um, some ep episodes are available with audio, some with video depending on who my guest is and their level of anonymity. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, we're far and wide. Okay. All right. So um, with that being said, um, we're going to be wrapping up. And I want to just say to all our listeners and viewers, um, I've been having a very engaging and enlightening conversation with uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Amy Myers. Again, she's a PhD, licensed clinical social worker, professor at Malloy College, and she has 30 years of experience in the therapy uh, realm, and she has a wonderful podcast called What Would Dr. Myers Do? And if someone um, is interested, uh, do you um, take uh, solicited calls for, 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 for people who are looking for therapy services or or um, just do? Well, my practice is, is I'm maintaining it kind of small at this point because I have okay. so many other uh, projects that I'm working on, but I am always happy to consult and you can find that on my uh, website, amymyersphd.org, okay. um, or you can reach out to me, uh, drmyerspod at gmail.com. Okay. All right. uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was Absolutely. Always, always great to engage with you. And, and uh, the last thing I like to do on all my podcasts, as we get ready to leave, I always like to ask my guests to give listeners and viewers uh, something that they can take with them um, as a parting thought. So please share something that you would like to leave listeners and viewers with. Wow. <laughs> Just one? Uh, okay. What, what One thing would I want? Um, things are rough out there. We're all, all facing challenges. Um, 
in one way or another, if not multiple ways. And I would just say, like, be a little kinder to yourself. And if you can be a little kinder to yourself, you're probably going to be able to be a little kinder to others. And hopefully that vice versa, if you're kinder to other people, you'll see that that starts to have an effect on you and your mood. Um, yeah, uh, just like we were talking about self-care, just take care of yourself, whatever that looks like, whatever that means. But we have to be able to tend to ourselves so that we can be uh, our best self for others and that we can get the most out of our relationships with others. Okay. All right. And on, on that note, thank you so much. We've been listening to Dr. Amy Myers, this is Silas, the e journalism social work advocate, host of the Kelso on the Air Social Work Podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers, for being our very, very insightful and enlightening guest this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, this is Silas, your e-journalism social work advocate, producer, and host of the show. You've been listening to the award-winning Kelson on the Air social work podcast. This and all other episodes are available on our Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon Music, Audible, and iHeart audio podcast platforms, among others. The podcast is also available on our Spotify and YouTube video podcast platforms. Go to any search engine and type in Kelson on the Air in the search window to hear this show in its entirety. Please make sure to click subscribe to support our podcast. And don't forget to like, comment, download, and share. To reach us for more information, email us at info at kelson.org. That's info at kelson.org. Or to suggest future topics, log into www.kelson.org. That's www.kelson.org and fill out the share a topic form on our homepage. Thank you for tuning in. This has been a Kelson Communications production.